Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a new episode of Reinvent Money. My name is Richard van der Linde. Uh, I'll be your host today and with us is Dr. L. Randall Ray from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, Dr. Ray wrote the book Understanding Modern Money as early as 1998 and more recently he authored Modern Money Theory, a primer on macroeconomics for sovereign monetary systems. He's also starring in the recent documentary called Boom Bus Boom by our very own uh, Theo Kocken, who is one of the writers of that, and uh, which is getting a lot of attention in the media uh, at the moment. Dr. Ray, welcome. Thanks. Would you be here? Um, as a start, could you explain what the essence is of MMT, Modern Monetary Theory? Well, we, we start uh, with the recognition that a national government that issues its own money is nothing like a household or a firm. And so whenever we hear a politician say that if I ran my household budget the way the United States government runs its budget, I would go bankrupt. And then implying that the, it's the national government that is operating in the wrong manner. Um, we say this is complete nonsense. The Uncle Sam is nothing like a household, nothing like a firm. Uncle Sam is the issuer of our currency. Uh, Uncle Sam can never run out of money. So when o President Obama, uh, after the global financial crisis, said, you know, well, we really wish we could do more to get the economy out of the very deep recession, mm -hmm. but we've run out of money. Well, this is completely false. And so it's either he doesn't understand how the monetary system works, or he's just flat out lying to the population. Um, so that's the, the, the main difference between us and the mainstream. Then we, we need to go into all the details of how it is that governments actually spend, why they can't run out of money, why they can't be forced to default on their own obligations, why they are not subject to the whims of the bond vigilantes who might decide not to lend to the government. You know, and all this other nonsense that has built up over the past 40 years. Right. Yeah. So basically you say a government and a household cannot be compared in the sense that the government is the issuer of money uh, and needs to spend it first before it can collect the money through taxation, for instance, whereas a household should first earn the money before it can spend. Yeah, uh, almost. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I try not to use the word money in the way that you are because then uh, we get it all uh, uh, bundled up in uh, the misunderstandings of the terminology right. uh, and of semantics. So I would say the government is the issuer of our currency rather than saying the issuer of our money. Uh, it is our currency that the government issues. Um, and that uh, households and firms can issue IOUs. They, they can issue liabilities that are denominated in money. So, uh, and my former professor was Hyman Minsky, who appears in the film that you were just uh, mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to say, anybody can create money. The problem is to get it accepted. And what he meant was that anybody can sign their name, IOU $5. Mm -hmm. The problem is to get others to accept it. Okay? So uh, households need to earn income. And uh, when their income is short, they might decide uh, to issue IOUs, which promise to pay, plus promise interest. And they can become insolvent in those promises. It might turn out they actually cannot repay those loans. Um, the sovereign government is different. It promises to pay its own currency. It cannot run out of its own currency. So this is a big difference between households and the government. All right. Um, does that also mean that the government can spend as much as it wants on anything it wants? Or is there an, a natural limit to it before you enter um, um, inflation or even hyperinflation. Yeah, well, you would definitely hit inflation and perhaps eventually hyperinflation 
if the government decided the sky's the limit, I'm going to spend uh, without any limit whatsoever, then uh, of course the government could drive the economy to an end, high inflation. Mm -hmm. um, the limit is real resources. So if the government only purchases or hires resources that are currently unemployed, then that will not be inflationary by itself. But if the government starts bidding against the private sector, saying we'll pay more than you pay, uh, and if the private sector reacts by upping their bids, then the government can start a bidding war and cause inflation. So the government needs to be very careful in how much it spends. The problem is not insolvency, the problem is inflation. Okay. And um, how do we know if, if the government is, is spending enough or maybe too much or perhaps not even enough? Yeah, well, there are two indicators. Um, one is if there are unemployed resources uh, in the economy. So uh, unemployment by itself is evidence that the government is not spending enough okay. to employ people. Um, however, you can get inflation before you get full employment. It depends on what the government is uh, buying. So the, if the government said that um, we're going to um, colonize Mars, and our goal is to do that within the next 10 years, then you can imagine that the government is going to start bidding up the prices of the labor resources and the other kinds of inputs to missions to Mars. Uh, this could very easily lead to a bidding war for the most skilled engineers and so on, because the, the government would be bidding already employed resources that are being used in the private sector, the government would be bidding those away. The government can win the bidding war, and that will probably cause inflation even before full employment. So it's very important for the government to focus <clears throat> its spending in areas where there's excess capacity. Right. In that case, it's not going to be inflationary. All right. Um, uh, MMT um, is seen as, as one of the more alternative views on economics. Uh, it's, it's not really considered mainstream. However, uh, it seems to be picked up more and more by the mainstream media outlets and, and for example, yesterday uh, Bloomberg covered uh, MMT in one of their articles um, in which President Obama was quoted uh, with saying, uh, small businesses and families are tightening their belts, their government should too. What, what do you think of such a statement? Well, that's a complete misunderstanding of macroeconomics as it's been taught for Oh, 80 years. Um, during the Great Depression, we, under, we came to understand, and, and I mean by we, uh, policymakers, politicians, and almost all economists, almost all, understood that in a deep downturn, the government has to move in the opposite direction of the economy. It needs to expand. Um, in, early in the Great Depression, um, uh, you know, they didn't understand this, and they thought that the best solution was to liquidate everything, sell everything, uh, unemploy everybody, and somehow that that was going to be the right solution to the Great Depression. But what they found out is the government has to spend more, and it may need to cut taxes too. That is the way that you get an economy out of a deep downturn. Yeah. So. Is, is that, that in line with the Keynesian view that, that in, in a downturn of the economy with a slump, the government needs to step in and actually spend more to get more effective demand in an economy, actually to, to get uh, the economy by itself on a higher level where the government can step back? Yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> nowadays we say that's the Keynesian view. And, and Keynes gave the theoretical justification for this in his 1936 book. But in the United States, we were already doing that. Uh, President Roosevelt uh, enacted the New Deal, and that was substantially already in place by the time the general theory came out. So it was recognized already before Keynes 
that the government needed to spend more, the government needed to hire the unemployed. So, <clears throat> yes, it, it's good to give Keynes the credit, but uh, he wasn't the only one who recognized this. Okay. Um, there seems to be a lot of um, support for, for the, the, the positive money movements uh, that we have throughout Europe. Um, every country seems to have their own movement. Um, what's your take on their view that the government can, uh, seems to be close to what you're saying, can spend more, can actually <coughs> some sort of a basic income um, or, or civilians dividend, um, and by that stimulating the economy, and they can actually issue that money uh, debt free. Um, well, what is you your know, on that? I, I'm I'm glad to see people advocating the government playing a bigger role in the economy, and understanding that the government can spend its own currency into existence. I think that these are um, uh, important understandings that have been lost for a very long time. I, Everyone understood this in the 19th century, that governments spend their currency into existence. It was obvious. And so a lot of the people today are going back and looking at the, the greenbacks, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also look at the tally sticks used all over Europe. The governments spent their own currency into existence, taxed it back, and then burned the tax revenue as soon as they received it back. They just burned it. They understood the government does not spend tax revenue. The government spends so that taxpayers can pay their taxes. So it's nice that we're sort of recovering ideas that have been lost a long time. But I think there's an awful lot of confusion in the positive um, money um, movement. And frankly, I can't quite get a handle on what they think they believe. Uh, this idea that you can issue a debt-free money is just complete nonsense. Government currency is the government's liability. The government is liable to accept it back in tax payment. Right. If, they, if the government said, we're going to issue currency, but we're not liable for anything, we don't have to take this back, uh, it's not going to get accepted. Currency right. needs to be redeemed in tax payment or other payments to the government. And this is the way that it always worked in the past. So I don't know why they refuse to actually look in detail at the way things worked in, in the 19th century, the way that greenbacks actually worked. These were debts of the government. All right, and they were debts because they, uh, the, the, the currency that was issued um, by the government spent, spent as, as, as money, uh, had to be accepted for tax payments, right? Yeah, in fact, in the United States, every time there was a paper money act enacted by the government, mm -hmm. so it would authorize the government to issue paper money, it also uh, imposed taxes for redemption. They were called redemption taxes. They were to redeem the currency. This was how the government made sure that that currency would be demanded. And then they would take it out of the economy when the taxes were paid. So everyone understood this in the 19th century. I don't know why it's so hard to understand now. No. Do you have any idea where the, the confusion uh, comes from? Because a few weeks ago, we interviewed uh, Stephen Zerlenger on, on this channel, on the show. And he said, and I quote, um, MMT's focus on credit debt as money is the iron. Uh, there are plenty uh, of other money forms. They should read NAP. And now I know you're quite aware with NAP, so... Um, I started with NAP. Yeah, could you and explain what NAP's ideas are and, and, and how you feel about that? Yeah, well, uh, NAP um, developed what he called the state theory of money. It is that the state issues its own currency the state imposes taxes, and the state can name what it will accept back in tax payment. I think what might possibly be confusing, uh, Zarlenga, is that he also said governments can choose if they want to, to accept back private banknotes in tax payment, and thereby sort of give them the status of a state money. This is true, but I, I don't understand why he thinks that we don't understand math. That's where the whole modern money 
theory movement started with math. Someone who's much better actually is um, Mitchell Innes, who wrote a little bit after Knapp and it doesn't seem to have been aware of Knapp's writing, which was Now, we seem to have a small issue with the connection. What he did was to generalize the credit theory of money to include state money. We made it very clear that state money is also a credit money and mm -hmm. the uh, debt of the issuer, which the state must take back in payment in the same way that banks must take back their own bank notes. In the old days, they used banknotes instead of bank deposits. They must take those back in payments to the banks. So in other words, if you have a debt to the bank, you repay that debt in the old days by delivering banknotes to the bank. Today, you write a check on your banking account. So you use your checking deposit. The bank must take this back in redemption. If it doesn't, it is defaulted on its obligation in the same way that a state that refuses to take back its own currency in tax payment is defaulting on its obligation to take it back. So this is what Anna said in 1913-14. I, I think if Zarlenga would read that, he might improve his understanding. Of the okay. To, to, to get it clear, um, uh, would you call bank credit money? Would that fit the, the definition of money for you? Well, remember, I don't like to get into these semantic uh, debates. Uh, this the bank deposit is a money denominated liability issued by the bank. So I wouldn't call it money itself. I would reserve the term money to mean the unit of account. In the United States, it's the dollar. In Europe, it's the euro, and so on. So let, let's call let's use the term money for the money of account, and then we can issue. Keynes called them money things, but we can also call them money records. Um, we can all issue money records denominated in that money account. A bank deposit is a money record. It's a record of the bank's liability to the deposit holder. Okay. So I got a question. Uh, that's awkward terminology, but it's precise. Right. And so we don't get into an argument about whether the bank deposit is money or the currency is money or bank reserves held at the central bank are money or a checkable savings account is money. Uh, the dividing line between what most people want to call money and what I am calling money denominated liabilities is arbitrary. Right. It changes over time. And what most people seem to mean is something you can actually go to the store and use to buy something, um, which you know is sort of a a rough and ready definition that sort of works a lot of the time. But then you start getting into debates because there are things that have almost all those characteristics, but at sometimes in places they're not accepted in payment, right. which is true even of currency. Fly on the airplane and try to use your cash to buy a glass of wine. Some airlines will say, no, we don't take currency. We only take credit cards. Others will say, we don't take credit cards. We only take currency. So yeah, sometimes you can use currency, sometimes you can't. Yeah. Yeah, I want to go into um, uh, Bitcoin with you, but first I got a question from one of our viewers, um, Johan Zelsna. He asked, did the Roman Republic use a credit money system? Um, yes, it did in the sense that, sure, they issued coins, and the coins were the liability of the state. They were accepted back by the state and payments to the state at the nominal value. Yes. Okay. Now, a lot of people get confused because it, it was very common from the time of the Greek city-states until, well, the 20th century to issue coins that have some precious metal content. So a lot of people think, oh, gold coins, uh, are not consistent with what you're arguing because gold coins are a commodity money. But actually, this is not true. If you, you look at the Roman coins or the Greek coins, they never have uh, a value stamped on them, but they, the nominal value of them is determined by 
what nominal value they are accepted at in payments to the state. Right. So it is true that in some circumstances, the value of a coin can fall to the value of the precious metal embodied in the coin. And that would be either because the state has defaulted on its promise to accept these mm -hmm. in payments, or because you're well beyond the boundaries of the state that issued them. And therefore, they become nothing but precious metal. But that is the exception. In Roman law, coins were valued by the nominal value, not by the commodity money value. And the nominal value is almost always well above the commodity uh, gold or silver value of coins. Okay, so, so it was a credit money system, but there was the backing of the commodity value of the, the type of money they were using. No, <coughs> let's do it this way. Coins are the debt of the state that issues them, and that, date, that debt happens to be stamped on precious metal. Right. That's all. Okay. It happens yeah. to be stamped on precious metal. Yeah. And exactly why they stamp it on precious metal rather than on a clay tablet or a piece of paper or notch it in a tally stick or stamp it on base metal mm -hmm. is uh, partly uh, sort of a, a custom and tradition, partly technology to reduce counterfeiting, and partly a um, possible mercantilist story. So we need to get into the specifics of each individual uh, gold coin or silver coin, why it was issued that way, um, in order to explain why they used precious metal rather than just stamping on uh, a piece of paper. Okay. Often the answer is counterfeiting. Right. So it wasn't because of the intrinsic value of the gold. It actually got the intrinsic value from the fact that it was used as money, probably. It, it got its nominal value from the fact that it could be used to make payments, yes. Okay, all right. Um, well, we talked about um, uh, what government policy uh, uh, should be aimed at or what indicators it could use to see if it should uh, stimulate more um, or not. And uh, that, that's where you talked about unemployment. Uh, MMT seems to go hand in hand also with the, the job guarantee, uh, a program where uh, any unemployed in a country um, actually gets the opportunity to work for the government. Um, that seems to be um, uh, a program that is not really appealing, especially not to, for instance, the Austrians. Um, could you explain what the job guarantee is and, and how that would influence the, uh, the, the size of the government? Yeah, well, as we were um, talking about before, uh, if there are unemployed resources, then you can essentially costlessly put those to work. Uh, in the private interest and in the public interest. It's an economic waste to leave them unemployed. And by far the biggest economic waste uh, around the world in every country I've ever uh, visited was unemployed labor. It's a huge economic waste and it actually um, creates tremendous costs. So it's not just that you lost the output and so on that you could have had. It creates uh, private cost to the unemployed and their families, and tremendous social costs in the form of um, social unrest and crime and so on. So this is a big waste. Um, and uh, so we argued that you can put this to work to, in the public and private interests. A sovereign government cannot run out of its own money. So it's not a question of affordability, it's always affordable. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, potential problems would include inflation. But if you're hiring people who are unemployed for whom the 
private sector's demand is not sufficient, or otherwise they would be employed already, then you're not competing with the private sector. So you can employ those workers without causing inflation. Uh, I also said that the government has to be very careful in its spending. I talked about the, the race to Mars or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, this is a form of targeted spending where you're spending exactly on the uh, resources that are unemployed and you can put the, them into sectors where there's sufficient slack. So what you're going to do is target your spending where there is already slack. That way you're not going to compete with the private sector. So this is why you can have an increase of government spending without sparking inflation before you get to full employment. So you can uh, bring up the employment level and start approaching full employment without causing the inflation that uh, military Keynesianism or uh, NASA exploration of Mars might do long before jobs ever trickle down to the unemployed. Right. You target the unemployed directly. Right. And would this be a policy that can uh, be used in every country uh, simultaneously uh, and also for a longer period or time, of time? Or would you then perhaps get into um, a mode where we by, by innovation and, and um, increase of production, uh, start to consume more and more, and then, let's say, given uh, Jevons' paradox, at some point just run out of the natural resources. Would that not, not be like an yeah. end point that you reach then? Well, so what you want to do is um, put people to work in environmentally sustainable occupations which um, I think is relatively easy to do if um, you are creating jobs with the purpose that you're going to uh, first provide employment, second, on-the-job training um, and skills development, and, and third, do things that are in the community's interest to serve the public purpose, um, rather than simply pursuing a profit motive. It's much harder to, uh, ensure that jobs created pursuing the profit incentives um, are going to be environmentally sustainable. Okay. These jobs can be environmentally sustainable and in fact can be uh, targeted to improve the environment, to re <coughs> restore the environment. So that's the sort of thing that um, we're advocating. Uh, you would like the um, uh, jobs to be green jobs. You also would like to improve the um, training and education of workers so that they become more employable in the private sector so that they can be recruited out of there into private sector jobs. Um, the, the idea that robots are gonna displace all the workers uh, is a, a huge topic and really a, a different topic. I'm ex extremely skeptical of this. Humans are just so phenomenally imaginative. When I fly on airplanes and find out what the person next to me does for a living, I'm always surprised it's a job I'd never heard of and never would have imagined we need. Uh, I think that we can come up with plenty of things to keep, busy, keep people busy. Of course, reducing the work week is something that we should be doing in the United States. We got our eight hour day well over a hundred years ago. And there's been no reduction, in fact, an increase in the work week since then for those lucky enough to be employed. Um, so I'm all for reducing the work week, but I'm not at all worried that robots are going to displace human labor. Okay, so, so you would say a, a job guarantee program? So everyone can, who wants to work can actually work, provided by the government, and then also over time gradually reducing uh, the hours in the work week perhaps even to the 15 hour work week that, that Keynes predicted? Yeah, uh, just one, one thing I, I want to clarify though, um, when we talk about a job guarantee, these are not necessarily uh, government jobs. The, the national government needs to provide the funding for the jobs because only the national government can do that. 
national government can't run out of money. So they can afford uh, to um, pay the wages of the people in the program. Mm -hmm. But uh, each nation might choose a different path to achieving full employment this way. Could you they give us a few uh, examples, maybe? Well, uh, they, okay, so a generic example. Um, they might decide that it makes much more sense to have um, not-for-profit NGOs um, do the job creation and manage the projects that are uh, go through some kind of an approval process, and then the government pays the wage. So, for example, it could be a local community organizations that first know who the unemployed are because they're dealing with them uh, through their outreach programs and also know what the communities need. So we have a happy coincidence here, double coincidence, where they know who's un unemployed and they know what the community needs. Why not match those two together and have the national government pay the wages to get it done? So I think that this can be highly decentralized, as decentralized as you want, which makes sense in a country like the United States, where we have community service organizations everywhere in the United States, in every city. And their major problem is they can't afford to hire people to do what they know needs to be done. In other countries, it may make more, much more sense for the central government to uh, plan the projects and actually employ the workers. So what I'm saying is you can you know, let a, flower, a thousand flowers bloom. You can do it a variety of ways. The only, I'd say there are two important things. One is the national government pays the wage. And second, the wage is uniform. And you hope it's going to be at a living wage right. Right, throughout the country. So all the jobs will pay the same wage. This is yeah. important. In, um, and it also said the minimum wage in the country, that's right? Exactly. It sets a, a minimum wage that actually is an effective minimum wage. Hyman Minsky used to always ask students in class to say, what's the minimum wage in the United States? Well, at the time, let's say it's $3.25 an hour. So some bright student will raise their hand and say that. And Minsky said, no, it's zero. He says, because if you can't get a job, your wage is zero. He said, you need the job guarantee to make it an effective minimum wage. It does no good to tell people that the legal minimum wage is seven seventy-five an hour if you can't get a job. Yeah, so it's so about the effective minimum wage. Yes. Right. Um, I think this all makes sense. I mean, in the sense that it is very clear uh, what your views are. Um, those, however, are uh, examples for uh, countries where the government is the currency issuer, the sovereign government. Um, in the Netherlands, but also in the other Eurozone countries, uh, we have the the, 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 uh, the monetary union. So that makes a big difference, doesn't it? In the sense that, that the government can actually run out of, would you say currency or money? <laughs> yeah, yeah sort of. They can sort of run out of it. <laughs> so uh, even before the, um, the Euro, um, put into place, uh, we predicted there would be problems. Um, and I know that there were some other people too. It wasn't just uh, modern money theory uh, people who predicted the, exactly the problems that resulted. Um, and uh, in a way, uh, it hasn't been quite as bad as I thought. Because the target two allows quite a bit of slot. And so it's true that, you know, ultimately the ECB is the issuer of the currency, of the euro. Just so for our viewers, the, target two, you mean the payment systems? Yes. The money flows yeah. from one country to another. Yeah, that, that added some slop. So technically the ECB is the issue, issuer of the euro. But every member central bank within the, their own um, country also can issue euros in their country. Uh, now, there, there were supposed to be tight prohibitions on the central banks from financing the treasuries, um, but the, uh, the ECB, I'm sorry, the central banks can sort of do a, an end run around this if private banks buy them first and then the central banks buy 
bonds from the private banks, which is exactly what the Fed does too, then you're sort of indirectly providing finance. The, the problem for the member nations is that you have to clear with the other members and your central bank cannot create the euros you need to clear with the other central banks. So if you could actually close your economy, the uh, member nations could be more or less okay. Uh, they're stuck with a fixed exchange rate against all the other members, which is a bit of a problem, but they're sort of okay. The problem is that the euros leave. And then you've got to make payments to the other central banks, and you can only make those with ECB euros, not your own euros. So target two was created to provide a bit of a leeway or slop in the system. Mm -hmm. And so you have uh, the uh, Mediterranean countries who have to borrow tremendous amounts of Euro to clear accounts, mostly with the center, especially with Germany. And the ECB has allowed that to go on, but this is at the whim of the ECB. Um, and they sort of give signals that they might not allow it to continue to occur. And there's a, a real danger that they will stop the lending and then all bets are off. Could you say that, 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 that uh, ex ante, the, the problems that we see now with, with countries like, for instance, Greece or Italy <laughs> have been predicted and modeled? Because if you have a country in a monetary union that is a net importer permanently at some point runs out of money? Well, that's right. So if you compare the uh, EMU area with the United States, both of these have currency unions. We have the dollar union, they have the euro union. Right. In the United States, we have many states, I don't know how many, that are chronic importers from the other states. Okay. Um, and we have our own version of Target 2. It runs through the Fed. In the US, we have um, essentially 12 central banks spread around the country. And um, the clearing goes through these things. Our advantage is we don't have states associated with their own central banks. It's regions, not states. So we don't even keep track of who are the net importers and who are the net exporters. Yeah, I can so some guess. states subsidize the other states, basically. Yeah, in a, in a sense they do. But then Uncle Sam also distributes his spending around the country in a way to offset that. So we have chronic net importing states, and they are really not subsidized by the other states. They're subsidized by Uncle Sam. So Uncle Sam will put a lot of his projects in those states so there's a flow of dollars into the states to match the flow that is out. And of course, what you have in the EMU is that the total budget for the European Parliament is less than 1% of GDP. And so you have some redistribution this way, but it's far too small to offset the net imports of a country like Greece. And what no, you say then that the way to go about it is to, is to actually go a step further and create a fiscal union, or right. would you actually um, try to detach the, the currencies again and, and go back to the old regime with every country being the, the sovereign issuer of, of, of that money? Which way would you go if, if you were the president of, of Europe? <laughs> you have to do one or the other. Right. The system you have absolutely will not work. It cannot work. From the, the design itself was flawed, which is exactly what we said. The design is flawed. It cannot work. It will lead to crisis. You are now in a crisis you will not get out of. Europe will not get out of this crisis. No matter how much they might hope that it, some miracle is going to happen, it is not going to happen. Uh, they will not get out of it. So you have to do one or the other. It, you know, if I were a European, I would be rooting for the fiscal union. That makes the most sense. Um, if you really believe in European unity, and a lot of Europeans that I know do, then you must go for the fiscal union. Now, if you just want to be European, then the ones you know, they must be Southern Europeans, the ones you know. Then 
a lot of them are Southern European. That's true. Yeah. I, I lived in Italy, and uh, many of my friends are there. Now, many of them uh, were supporters of the euro in the beginning, and now oppose the euro. They they still like the idea of European uh, unity, but they understand the euro is the problem. So if it's impossible to do the fiscal union, then they must leave. Yeah. The sooner the better, because all they're doing now is prolonging the pain, uh, and eventually they're going to have to leave. So they might as well go now. Yeah. So you mean kind of the the like the the Brits basically have the status now of being in the EU, but not being in the EMU. That that would be the way to go about it then. Well, if they're allowed to be in the EU once they leave. Yeah. Yeah. That's. I, I don't expect it to be, but um, are there any, uh, say, low-hanging fruits for, uh, for example, Dutch politicians now, because they are faced with the fact that they are in this EMU and not within a fiscal union, so they need to somehow manage a budget um, with a surplus or a deficit. Uh, they have to deal with the economic crisis, uh, but they have all these limitations because they, they have the limit of how much budget deficit you can have. What would you advise uh, be to um, Dutch policymakers in this situation? Well, you, the, the members of the EMU are in a beggar thy neighbor situation. Uh, so if you pursue your own individual self-interest, then you do what Germany does. Right. They, uh, you, you want to outcompete everybody so that you can be an exporter. That is the only way you can succeed in in the way that it is set up now. So it's, it's fundamentally antisocial yeah. um, and will lead to disillusion and maybe war. Yeah. So, that's so try, try to export as much as you can. That's basically your advice. Yeah. That's yeah. the only thing you need. Right. Okay. Um, we have 10 more minutes. I uh, would like to talk a little bit about the banking system. Uh, we touched upon it a little bit when we talked about the positive money proposals. Uh, yeah. which is, is not only about issuing the money, but also about the role of the banks in the, uh, in the monetary system. Yeah. Um, what do you think of, of fractional reserve banking in general? Is that yeah. one of the problems that we uh, have in the system right now, or would it be something that can still exist in a world where m and is, is being used as the dominant uh, theory? Yeah, so th that's sort of the the other half of the uh, the critics of the monetary system. So they they want to go back to greenbacks, government just issuing currency when it spends and and supposedly debt free money. And the other thing is to put very tight constraints on banks. If you let them survive at all, you might uh, want to make them what's called hundred percent reserve or narrow banking. Yeah. So that they have to hold uh, nothing but government bonds. They can't uh, make loans. They hold the bonds against uh, deposits. And they so, also run into this this idea of not having reserves at all, but having like real money uh, that can be lent onwards to others, right? Okay, that's yeah. the, the Islamic banking would be a, another possibility where uh, really, you're just a shareholder. Um, you buy shares in a bank, and then the bank uh, will lend those out. You know that you're taking a risk because you're a shareholder, not a depositor. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I I think that uh, first, everyone is almost everyone except the people who happen to be in the top one tenth of one percent and living on Wall Street. Everyone else is mad at the banks. So am I. Completely understand that. The banks are completely out of control. That's absolutely true. We need to restrain them. So the question is, uh, what kinds of constraints make sense? I think that we need to get um, our chartered banks back into the commercial banking business. What commercial banks used to do is they make short-term loans, largely to businesses, but they might also <clears throat> make some loans to consumers. And they issue the deposits that are the basis of the payment system. That's, that system works perfectly fine. The banks do underwriting, they, which means they do credit assessment so that they make loans that have very high probability of repayment. 
and then they issue the demand deposits that we all use. And connecting those two things together is traditional banking. It worked very well. The, the problem is that we freed the chartered banks to get into all sorts of other stuff, um, which uh, was vastly more risky, but more important than that, much easier to engage in massive fraud, which is the, has become the business model of the biggest banks. They, they just engage in fraud. Um, so 100% money or um, getting rid of banks altogether <clears throat> is returning to the system that, that worked very well that um, uh, has a logic to it in that the money in the form of deposits is being created as part of the production process so that money is linked to production by commercial firms. Um, that helps to make sure that we sort of have the right amount of money in the economy uh, because it's being created to finance the loans that are necessary in order to get production underway. Mm -hmm. uh, that money is then used to buy the output of the firms. And at that point, in a sense, we say the money is destroyed because the bank loans are repaid. So this sort of a logic um, that's made famous by the Franco-Italian circuit approach to money mm -hmm. um, uh, is appealing yeah. and sort of accurate uh, to a description of the way the commercial banking worked. Our big problem is outside of this. It is all of the speculation, the derivatives, the uh, making bets uh, against people's homes and against their lives with credit default swaps, all that stuff that accounts for 99% of the financial system now. That's where the problems are. That's so what we're going to be attacking. Get rid of the big banks, because basically what they do is fraudulent, their business model, uh, separate the payment system from, from the lending. No, no, I would not separate the payment system from the lending, but I would separate it from the big, big banks and all of those kinds of activities. Okay. And I think I also read somewhere that, that you were in favor of having the government um, taking back the, 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 the payment system and perhaps also the, the, the commercial and, and, and SME lending uh, within the economy as well. Rather than take it back, I would have the government compete with them. Okay. So uh, I see nothing wrong with uh, having uh, reviving our postal saving system, which we had in the United States. Uh, Italy had a postal saving system. Japan had a, still has a postal saving system. So that you can use that uh, for your payments. You can uh, have your wages paid into your postal savings account, and you can make payments, uh, utility companies and taxes and so on, through that a very efficient way to do it. The reason why I would like the government to do this is to compete with the private banks right. so that they can't get away with discriminating against uh, depositors who are low income, so that they can't get away with charging outrageous fees if you happen to bounce a check occasionally. You have the postal savings system as a, uh, an alternative to keep the other banks honest, to right. compete with them. And can it also be a cryptocurrency, for instance, the, the payment system? Would that be... Uh... No, the bit, Bitcoins will never become uh, a significant part of the payment system. Uh, this is for speculators and drug dealers, strictly. That's, that's what it's all about. The, the fair value of a Bitcoin is zero. Right. Nobody promises you anything. These are debt-free money. I mean, if this is really what the debt-free money people want, is Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies, um, this is never going to be significant because the value is not guaranteed. There's nothing driving the currency other than speculation and the need for drug dealers to be hidden from law enforcement. Right.
And that's where it derives the, the current dollar value from. Yeah, and I mean, I know that some people are just fascinated by the technology and the mining technology and all that. And, and no doubt some others are going to rise up and then also collapse. But the problem is the fair value is zero. The fair value of a $1 US bill is $1. You know that it's going to be accepted at a nominal value of a dollar. Now, some people say, I don't know what the real value is because you can get inflation. Okay, sure, fine. The only promise is in nominal terms. With a Bitcoin, there is no promise whatsoever. No one has issued this as a liability. No one has to take it back in payment. Its fair value is zero. So according to your definitions also, it's, it's not money in a sense. It's not. Right, it's not. okay. Um, well, we're almost at the end of the interview. I have a few more questions, if, if that's okay with you, from sure. our viewers. Um, one is about the basic income. Uh, we talked about the job guarantee, but uh, perhaps uh, could you explain why you are in favor of the job guarantee and, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe also for the basic income, or, or how do, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, well, I, I think if someone is ready and willing to work, the right thing to do is to offer them a job. Why would you refuse to give them a job and say, no, here, we'll just give you some cash. Go away and leave us alone. No, they deserve to work. It is a basic human right. It's recognized by the United Nations as a basic human right for everyone who wants to work to have a job. The United States and all other uh, developed capitalist countries are violating this basic human right. We need to provide them a job. We need to provide them a living wage. A job gives you more than money. Money alone does not give you access to the economy and to social networks in the same way that a job does. It doesn't give you the kind of respect that a job gives you. And so we need to provide the jobs first to anyone who's ready and willing to work. Now, that will still leave a small part of the population that is. Uh, not ready and willing to work. Um, note, I don't include uh, people living with um, disabilities in that group because the surveys show, at least in the United States, that 75% of uh, people with disabilities want to work. They want jobs. They just can't get them. Right. So I include those as being ready and willing to work. We should design jobs that they can perform. So once we've given everyone who wants to work a, a job, we're gonna be left with a residual that uh, either can't work or doesn't want to work or shouldn't work, shouldn't be working. And in that case, of course, we have to provide them with an income. Okay. So I'm not opposed to that at all. I, I think that the, the arguments for giving everybody enough income so that nobody has to work, where they actually have a choice uh, that they can reasonably make to either work or stay home at a pay that is sufficient to give them you know, the normal standard of living that other people in society would want. Um, you're, you're talking about uh, incomes of $50,000 a year in the United States. This is not feasible without causing a lot of inflation. Right. If everyone's gonna get this, whether they work or not, then effectively now my starting uh, uh, income before I work is $50,000. It makes no sense to me to argue that this is not going to cause prices and wages to go up. Yeah. So right. I, I think that this, uh, you'll be chasing this goal because the 50,000 won't be nearly enough yeah. once the prices and wages start to rise. So it's gonna have to be 60,000, then 70, then 80, and so on. Yeah. It's just gonna chase the prices up. Yeah. So if you then say, but we're not gonna give it to everyone, we're only gonna give it to the people who don't want to work, okay, then you're stigmatizing and you're not achieving what you claim to be achieving, which is to free everyone from the need to work. Right. If you're going to 
targeted only to those who don't work. Yeah, and you say it's it's a human right at least to have the the option to work if if you want to. That that's one of the main uh, differences with with the basic income, where we don't offer people um, the opportunity also to to uh, to gain the social value from work, but only give them the purchasing power that will only be sufficient for a period of time, after which you need to increase the amount of of income that you generate or provide. Right. Right. All right. Um, another question is about the trade deficit between the US and Japan and the dollar reserve of Japan is holding. Um, is that also in the end uh, uh, bad? And then doesn't say if it's bad for the US or Japan, but I <laughs> guess for, for the US. <laughs> is there a okay. problem if, if foreign current countries have your currency, have large holdings, um, is it, can that be problematic for the issuer? Well, uh, most people are, are worried about sort of the financial aspects, the money aspects of this. Um, but let's just first quickly look at the real aspect. So the real aspect is that the Americans are consuming a lot of products made by Japanese and now Chinese workers. So the Chinese workers are working very hard to produce stuff that they don't get to consume that is sent to America so that Americans can consume it. So who's being hurt? China and Japan. Because their workers are working hard to produce stuff they don't get to consume. Who's benefiting? America. So in, in real terms, uh, trade deficits are good things. You get to consume everything that you produce plus a portion of what the Chinese and Japanese produce. That's a good thing. So that is an advantage. Um, but what people are worried about is, and I think you know this isn't uh, controversial among economists, as long as we're sticking to the real terms, trade mm -hmm. deficits are a good thing. Uh, but they start to fear that, well, the Japanese might stop lending dollars to us to finance our trade deficits. Now that has got it exactly backwards. It is the U.S. trade deficit that finances the Japanese accumulation of dollar wealth. If we didn't uh, import from Japan, the Japanese wouldn't have the dollars. So all the dollars they got exist mostly in the Bank of Japan uh, or the Bank of China because we bought their output. So all those dollars came from us. It's not a matter of them lending to us dollars so that we can do this. We provided the dollars for them. Uh, does that burden the United States? Well, most of the dollars that are being accumulated are in the form of either reserves held at the Fed or the majority are treasuries issued by the United States government. So again, people will say, oh no, Uncle Sam has to borrow dollars from China to pay for its budget deficits. But again, this has got it exactly uh, turned on its head. The dollars they got came from uh, Americans purchasing their output that leads to an increase of bank reserves held by the Bank of China at the Fed. The reserves earn zero interest. So the Bank of China says, hey, we'd like to earn some interest on that. So the uh, Fed debits their bank reserves and credits their account that is treasuries. It's like moving money from a checking account to a savings account at the Fed right. so that the Chinese can earn some interest. What is the burden of that? The U.S. Uh, Treasury credits their uh, Treasury account with interest. Okay. Two, three, four percent uh, interest rate is credited to the Chinese. There's no burden of this. No. The, the only problem is that the government debt, the, the amount is rising, but it's only a burden if you pay attention to that or think it's important. Right. Or if at some point in the future, some future American generation decided to pay off all the debt by taxing itself more. Okay. Now, fortunately, Americans are not that dumb. So they have this great fear of debt, but they don't impose taxes to retire it. We only did that once, 1837, President Andrew Jackson actually paid off all the government debt. Every generation since then has been sensible enough to never pay off the debt. Right? So. I think the probability that that will happen is very small. Right. But there's one other possible burden. 
what if the Chinese decide to use all of their uh, dollar accumulations to buy U.S. exports? Well, then Americans will have to do the hard work to produce the output that the Chinese are going to consume, which is exactly what most American politicians want. <laughs> they want us to run a trade surplus. And so they're really mad that we run trade deficits and they say we need to turn things around so we run trade surpluses. Well, if we ever get what they claim they want, that will be a burden on us. All right. But it, it's not going to happen in the near future. Okay. Uh, eventually, China probably will start to run a trade deficit, not just against the United States, I think against the world, as it becomes a wealthier uh, economy with high wages. Um, it will probably start to run trade deficits. So right. that will turn around. So for the U.S., it would be good to remain a net uh, importer and let the Chinese and the, uh, the other Asian countries be uh, the workers where they actually consume. As long as they want to do that. Yeah. Now, finally, of course, people will then say, but hold a second, we're losing jobs to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and I... Or what if it changes that, that, that they actually want to spend, like where, what you were talking about? Well, then we would get the jobs back. But I, I mean, yeah. in the short run, uh, our uh, trade deficits are, are said to lose two job losses in the United States. Uh, well, the answer, of course, is we have to create jobs in America. And that is why we need the job guarantee with a living wage we right. Need right away to replace the jobs that are lost to imports and also the, law, the jobs that are lost to the robots. Um, so we need to, to quickly put people to work. That's the right way to deal with a trade deficit. The, the wrong way would be to um, try to slow your economy down and use austerity to reduce imports, which is what most nations do when they're trying to reduce their trade deficits. They think that the answer is austerity, which of course just creates more unemployment at home. All right. All right. Dr. Ray, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, I believe everything that we talked about is also described in your book, Modern Money Theory. Uh, am I right? Uh, probably pretty close to it, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I believe this is the second edition. Can you perhaps yes. briefly explain what the difference is between the first and the, the second edition? The, uh, well, the big edition is a new chapter on the purpose of taxes. So uh, modern money theory says that taxes drive the currency and that uh, governments don't actually spend tax revenue, so they don't really need the taxes for revenue purposes. Um, but there are other, uh, I, so I explain all of this in much more detail. There also are other purposes of taxes. Okay, we wanna change people's behavior, so we tax sin, sin taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we may want to reduce the income at the top. So you have progressive taxes, high tax rates on the rich so that they won't be so rich. Um, and then finally, a, a discussion of um, what kinds of taxes make sense, what are good taxes, what are bad taxes. So there's that. There is more discussion of inflation and hyperinflation, and I separated it out from the discussion of the job guarantee and unemployment. So there's a, a, now a separate discussion because many people are worried about inflation, of course, and hyperinflation. Right. And I go through some of the experiences with hyperinflation and show that they were not caused by budget deficits, which a lot of people believe government just printing money causing the hyperinflation. Um, uh, there's something else that I've, yeah. It's slipping my mind right now. There, there's one of uh, taxation is one of the big additions to to the new uh, edition of your book. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, it seems like a also a good read for those who are uh, 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 exposed to to Bitcoin and investing in in cryptocurrencies to see what actually drives money and and gives money value. Am I right? Yes. All right. Well, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And. Um, well, hopefully we can uh, 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 speak again in the future. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.